Greetings again to all my father's children. Welcome to another Bible study where we are going to be drilling into the word to extract whatever nuggets we can pull to help us in our walk with Almighty God. It is so important, beloved, that we take the time out to study the word, to look at what is written there, to extract what we can uh, to help us to walk the way that we ought to walk in serving the living God. This Bible, this book was given to us to be our guide, uh, to be a light, a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. And it is important that we take the time out to read it. It is important that we take the time out to study it. And we have been, over the last few weeks, going through some things, pulling some nuggets from the word. And it is important that we take the things that we are looking at very seriously. Uh, my people, the very word says, are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And it is important that we understand that we can be saved and we can follow the path in terms of the salvation plan and we get saved. But it is important for us to understand and to appreciate that having been saved, it is important how we walk. It is important that we walk and that we walk in a certain way. And what is that way? How is it that we will know how to walk? It is what is prescribed in the book, the Bible, the Word of God. And so it is incumbent on us to take the time out to read and to study and to apply and to walk in the Word so that we can be confident when that day comes. As we stand before Him, we can be confident that we took the time out to pull from it and to govern ourselves according to the word and so be able to stand with some level of confidence before almighty god on that great day that is to come so we are going to continue on our uh, journey we have in the last couple of weeks been looking at some very important things pertaining to who we are as children of God and how we ought to walk. When we started out, we looked at the true child of God and we saw where we were um, illustrated as being the light of the world and being the salt of the earth. And we got some things from that that we can easily apply to our lives. And it is important that we learn these things and apply them to our lives. We then moved from there and we went over into the book of Proverbs and we went to Proverbs chapter 30 and we looked at verses about 18 and 19 and we saw some things because there are so many things that are written in the word that we can pull from and especially when we go over into the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is attributed to uh, Solomon, the wise man, and although there is Augur, I think some people even believe it's the same Solomon, but then although there are other writers that made some injections and put some thoughts into it, the, the majority, the large majority of the book of Proverbs is attributed to Solomon. And of course, we know the story well of who Solomon was, the son of David. We know, we, we know of the dream that he had and how God came down and bestowed upon him wisdom so much that no other man on the face of the earth, and of course we are not putting Jesus Christ into this, but no other man had the kind of wisdom that Solomon had. And folks from far and near came just to hear Solomon speaking and to hear the proverbs, the sayings that he had, and the wisdom that was behind those sayings. And to the extent that people came from near and far to hear him, it speaks volumes as to the man and 
the wisdom of the man, what God had impressed upon him, what God had given to him because of the heart that he had as it relates to him leading God's children. And that wisdom allowed Solomon to, to examine things that the ordinary person would have just glossed over. That wisdom allowed Solomon to look behind the reason for things happening. A simple thing like an ant, Solomon was able to look at that and present to us that we must learn from the ants. In fact, in the book of Proverbs chapter number 6 and verse 6, Solomon in writing said, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Solomon was saying to men like you and I, Go to the ants and learn her ways and we must extract what is there to be taught and learn from it and be wise. In other words, learn from the ants so that we can apply it and we can apply our hearts to wisdom. And what we are seeing in the book of Solomon is that in the book of Proverbs written by Solomon is that there are things, simple things like the ant, like the spider, like the grasshopper, like the corny. We are seeing in other situations, the serpent, a man with a woman, the ship, the eagle, things that we would probably just look at and see the eagle flying, sailing through the atmosphere, going up into the ice. We look at those things and it amazes us, but we just look at it and we say, my God, God is so good. We look at the ship going through the sea, and as far as we are concerned, it is just a ship traversing the, the oceans, going from place to place. And we, we, are, we are comfortable and we are satisfied with that. But the wise man Solomon and the others who were there that wrote into that book in Proverbs, those Proverbs, those short little words that behind them are filled with so much meaning. Proverbs are literally some short sayings you know um one one coke or full basket you know those are little proverbs and they have meanings behind them and we have some in our regular local culture that we can learn from but when we go to the book of proverbs we see some things that are there simple things simple sayings but beloved they are packed with meaning and when we extract those meanings, we realize that it's not just some words with some meanings, but these meanings, when we start to look at how Proverbs describe the thing, they, are all, they all have to do with wisdom. And what Solomon was saying in Proverbs, what the Proverbs were saying, is that there is this little force, this little thing that we have to contend with. The average man would see something and just take it for granted. But what Proverbs is saying is that behind the little things that we see, be, behind the ants going from <coughs> sorry, <coughs> his nest to another, behind the eagle soaring into the skies, behind the ship sailing across the ocean, are some little things that normally we would not see. And Solomon was saying, follow me. And let me show you some things. Let me, let me present to you some words of wisdom. And in the wisdom will be advice that we better embrace. Because we are finding that what Solomon is doing, what the writers in the Proverbs are doing, they are speaking to simple things like ways of life, relationship, sexual activities, romantic love, Walking righteously. All of these things has to do with you and I today. And so I submit to us, beloved, that from the very book of Proverbs, albeit it is the Old Testament script that some folks don't go back to. They believe we are outside of Old Testament jurisdictions. And so talk from Matthew to Revelation. That's not so. The entire Bible represents the word of God. And if a certain era is passed, there is something that might be pulled and carried over into this era. And even if the actual thing is not taken over, there are some principles that have come over. 
And we ought to understand that everything from Genesis to Revelation comprise the word of Almighty God. And so it behoves us to take time out and to look into the book, whether it's Genesis or it's Revelation or any books in between. It behoves us to get into them, drill down and learn, pick out the wisdom that is there hiding behind the ant, hiding behind the cony, hiding behind the spider, hiding behind the locusts, as simple and small as these things are. We have to understand that God placed them there. There's another scripture in the same book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 30, and about verse 24 going down. It says, there will be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. Sometimes it is the little things that teach us big and powerful lessons and teach us wisdom that otherwise we would not have known. So we are journeying, yes, this, the, the, these last few sessions through the book of Proverbs so that we can look at the small things, we can look at the insignificant things, the things that normally we would gloss over, the things that normally we would pass over. We want to take time at the little foxes, the little things that have major implications, that teaches us major things, and that throws at us wisdom that otherwise we would have not seen. So we started a few weeks ago, and we delved into Proverbs chapter 30, verses uh, 18 and 19 and we saw some things there and I'm going to take the time out now to share my screen with us because we're just going to do a quick quick review and then we are going to jump in to where we left off so that we can wrap up this section we started off with the eagle but then there is the snake then there is the ship then there is the man and the woman and so we are going to just do a quick quick review and then delve into where we had left off, jumped into where we had left off and drilled down and extract the message, the wisdom that is there so that they can help us in our walk. Whether it's to walk closer to God, our walk of righteousness, to appreciate the things that God had established for humankind to relate to and to benefit from, it is important that we take the time out, grasp, what is being said, learn the lessons and apply them to our everyday lives. So I'm going to share a screen with us now. And I want us to take our time and consider a few things that are extremely, extremely important as we journey through some areas of the book of Proverbs, so very important um, that we take the time out and go through these things. So we were at Proverbs chapter 30 as we opened, as we opened, and we are looking for that slide, we, are, we were at Proverbs chapter 30 as we did our introduction at the start of this uh, session, the, the series. And we saw in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse, verses 18 to 19 that there were some things, uh, there were some situations, some of them related to actual uh, animals, actual birds, actual creatures, some of them related to uh, things that are uh, not living beings, but like a ship and, and in the midst of the sea, some of them had to do with a uh, human kind, a man and a woman. The question is, what can we learn from these things? Are these, does these things have teachable situations in them? And the resounding answer, without doubt, is yes. And we are taking the time out to look at the four things that was mentioned there. We looked in Proverbs chapter 30, 
we look verses 18 and 19, there be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. And th these constituted the four things that we were looking at that we wanted to pull from and that we wanted to see what we could glean and notice what was of importance to the writer was not so much the eagle by itself but noticing every one of the situations that were mentioned the eagle the snake the ship and the man with a young maid for each of them it is the way that was the point that was crucial it was the object of the lesson the way of the eagle not the eagle but the way of the eagle the way of the snake not the snake but the way of the snake on a rock the ship in the midst of the sea not just the ship but the way of the ship in other words by looking at what the focus was being placed on the way it was signaling something because when we come to a particular way you speak about a road or a particular route a particular avenue to get to somewhere and depending on which avenue you take you can learn some things along the particular path that you were going so what is of significance what is the object of each of these things that the writer Augur was making mention of was the way and we have gone through some things already which we won't go back through to define and to explain to us what a way was you can go back to the past um, presentation and and pick up what was said there but having said this now we had gone into looking at the way of the eagle and we had spent some time going through with the eagle to find out exactly what the the way of the eagle represented and we saw that the eagle uh, taught us some serious lesson the eagle would fly out after a certain time when he, he, he reached that to that age where he felt that he was just unable he was getting old he, his, his feathers were burnt out his feathers were getting gray and 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 his, his beak was blunt and his, his claws were dull and all of those things the eagle realized that he just did not have what he had in his youth he recognized that something had to happen he had to go through a process of renewal and that eagle naturally knew that he would fly up into the mountains and go into a rock and rest on that rock and he would go through a process to sharpen his claws and go through a process to sharpen his beak and he would lie there prostrate prostrate and he would be on fasting and as a natural course his he would shed his feathers and he would start to push out new feathers and as those new feathers come and as the beak be came sharp again and as the the claws thongs became sharp again and the wings would have been strengthened with the new feathers that were coming on a process of renewal took place and that eagle after a certain time in the cleft of the rock way up in the mountain secluded away from everybody away from everything that eagle would be renewed and his strength would come back and that eagle that was getting old will find that having waited for that period in the rock and waited naturally waiting that refers to us waiting upon God and that's why the scripture said they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall mount up with wings like eagles the eagles went through the exact process that a child of God can go through and ought to go through as a part of his renewal process sometimes we get tired sometimes we get weary sometimes we feel that we can't make it but just like the eagle we can pull back and go into a period of fasting and prayer and believe it or not saints of God God takes us through a process where our mind is renewed and our strength comes back and even though we might be up there in age 
our system will, will, will tell us, yes, you can do it. And all of a sudden, the energy is there and the desire is there and the, the passion is there and we can go again. Yes, we might not be 18 or 20, but even if we are 60 or 70, what is happening on the inside, the renewal is on the inside and we have this sense that we can make it and we can go further and we can work for God still. It does not matter where we are in terms of on the calendar. It does not matter where we are so long as we have the energy and the strength and the mind we can accomplish things for God. And that is represented by the eagle soaring again back up into the heights. As old as he is, he can soar up to the heights because his feathers were renewed and his beak is now sharp again and his thongs or the claws are now sharp again and he feels renewed. And God allowed that to happen to the eagle naturally so that he can move on and he can fly again and he can achieve again and he can accomplish again and that is the life that is the experience that ought to be the experience of the child of God and so I say to you it doesn't matter where you are it doesn't matter how you feel at this point if it feels to you like you no longer have the fire and you're getting cold it is time for us to pull away from those friends and to pull away out of the crowd and to pull away from those folks and though are those individuals that might be the reason why you are getting cold and find that place in the solitude of the rock and shed those feathers and shed those weights that so easily beset us and start to allow God to sharpen you and to fix your eyes and to fix your beak and to fix your heart and to sharpen your perspective and your view so that you can soar again just like the eagle. And it is important that we all understand that that is a lesson that we must extract. That is the wisdom that we must apply to our lives. What is the wisdom? That no matter where we are, how far, how long we have been in this thing, we must understand that we can be renewed and the fire can burn again and the passion can be relit again and we can push on the final furlong until we soar to that place where God then lifts us up at the rapture and take us back with him. It's not a matter of age. It is a matter of where we are. And we can be on the firing line at 100 years of age and be ready for when Jesus comes. And that is the wisdom from the eagle. That is the lesson. That is what the writer is saying that we can pull from and learn and be wise and employ in our own lives so that we can keep soaring to new heights. And that was the way of the eagle. So now we are going to look at the way of a snake. The way of a snake on a rock. The question is, what can I learn, le learn from a snake? That's a, that's a, that is something very significant because as we hear of a snake, as we, we, we see the picture of a snake, we want to avoid that creature. We want to run away. And then when we look at the episode, when we look into the book of Genesis and see how the snake feature in the whole fall of man, the serpent, how he featured in the fall of man. We say, I will have nothing to do with a snake. I mean, I can easily understand that sentiment. I can easily, easily understand that sentiment. And so the, the, the snake waited for the right time, and he waited until Adam, who had the headship over that union, was a little bit away, and then he went to Eve. He knew something very perceptive. He knew that Eve was the, the weaker vessel, so to speak, how the Bible placed it. And he went at Eve when Adam was out and, and talked to her, whichever way he did it. And he 
sent some things to her, whether directly or subliminally. He sent some things to her. And at the end of the day, the Bible said the serpent beguiled Eve. Yes? So through trickery, through his understanding of some things, through the things that he knew, he was able to maneuver and mask himself and navigate around the things that God said to make what God said seem as if that is not what he meant. And so trickery and being, being beguiling, he was able to reach out and cause Eve to disobey the word of God. And we know all that transpired there. So there is this natural tendency for us to avoid and to shun Anything that has to do with a snake or, or when you talk about a serpent, it has to be evil. It is a representative of Satan. And so we, we shun it. But what we are seeing when we look at the writer in the Proverbs is that even in bad situations, even with bad things, there is a teaching moment that we must not lose sight of. And so we will easily gloss over the snake, the serpent, on a rock or wherever he is moving. We would easily gloss over that simply because we do not and we do want to have anything to do with that creature because of what we know the snake or the serpent represent. But I want us to understand, beloved, that even with the snake, even with the serpent and what he did and caused what we see today to be happening, he was behind it, no doubt about it. But even from that serpent, there is something that we can learn to advance our walk with God. And the writer in Proverbs said that it was a, a wonder and an amazement to him, just like the eagle. No, anybody would want to emulate and learn from the eagle because we see the eagle soaring up into the skies and we see the power and the majesty of the eagle. And so we'd want to emulate that eagle and whatever lessons we can learn, we will extract it, extract it and we will learn and we will go with it. But a snake, no way. Draw breaks, dear beloved. We can learn from our ants. We can learn from a spider. We can learn from the locusts. We can learn from the little conies that have their house built into the rocks. I want us to understand that. And if we can learn from a spider, a spider, we can learn from a snake. And I want us to understand that. It is in the word. In fact, when we look at the scriptures, we find in St. Matthew chapter number 10 and verse 16, something very significant because Jesus himself uh, made these utterances and it is significant what Jesus said behold I sent you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves be ye therefore wise as serpents what what is it that Jesus is saying that we that he is sending out as sheep in the midst of wolves we who today are Christians as we go out into the field Jesus is saying that we ought to be wise as serpents. No, here it is again, this time in the New Testament, and this time coming from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It means that there are things that even the serpent who we despise, we can learn from. And if we can learn a lesson, beloved, I remember my pastor used to teach, and he says, sometimes not everything you can just take up and run with. Sometimes even the, the, the agnostics, sometimes those that don't believe in God, the atheists, say some things. And there are things in what they say that we can pull out, that we can extract and use. So he taught us, learn to take the meat off the bone and discard everything else and go with what might have some value to you. And that is what we are presenting to you tonight. Nobody ought to love the serpent in the sense that we want to embrace Satan because Satan himself can teach you something. And I want to sit down on a table with him and make him teach me some words of, and give me some words of advice. Don't sit down with Satan and receive any word of advice from him. He's going to trick you. 
He's a and he's a liar. And he might present something to you if you dare to be foolish enough to want to sit around a conference table with Satan and say, teach me a thing here and there so that I can take what is good and nothing is going to be good. But then the serpent itself has some things about it in the way that he conducts himself, the way that it conducts itself, the way that it goes about and survive. It has no feet. It has no hands. Yes? A lot of other animals, they have two legs, they have four legs. They are able to jump around and protect themselves and maneuver and escape from the prey. Or they themselves are predators and they go after prey. But the snake doesn't even have one limb, not a foot, not a hand, not a finger. And yet it survives in the jungle. It survives in the wilderness. It survives wherever it goes. So there ought to be something about even the serpent and how he operates, which is what Jesus is saying, that we can learn from, that we should learn from. And so we must move to see what it is about the way of the serpent that we can learn from. We can adapt even the good characteristics of a serpent. And that is a point that I want us to note. And so the first thing I want to relate to us is that the serpent becomes one with its surrounded when it lies absolutely still. There is something about the serpent that once it is in a particular environment, once it is in a particular area, it hides itself. He knows, that creature knows when the enemy is coming and knows how to be still. That enemy knows how to camouflage. And the next slide shows that that enemy knows how to camouflage. It has the ability to camouflage itself and blend into the surroundings so that the prey cannot see them. And so while we are there and looking at that, looking in our surroundings, we are there in that wilderness era, we are there walking through the jungle. Sometimes no matter how we focus our attention, we are unable to see that reptile, we are unable to see that snake because he just cal he's just calm. He just blends in. He's not showing off his pretty colors. He's not showing off how big he is. If you look at a snake, you know, I see the, the design and the, the color and the, the interspersed uh, texture. You see a little bit of black here, a little bit of green here, overlaying a body of yellow. And the color can be beautiful. Sometimes the, that reptile is green and as a different shade going all the way down and by itself it is pretty it is beautiful folks used to kill snakes and take their skin and make shoes and the shoes that the snake skin make it is so expensive because of the beauty of the skin of the snake they kill that creature to use the skin to make shoes and a snake skin shoes beloved is very expensive yet as beautiful as that snake's skin is and you would think that like the ostrich he would spread it out and cause the the female to see it and to, no 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 sometimes when that ostrich do that for the female and is attracting that female and beauty is demonstrated when he spreads out his thing he's actually making himself vulnerable because the predator although he might not have known that he was around once he spreads out that thing everybody sees it and it's big and it's beautiful and it is for all to see and of course his main reason was for the the female was it the ostrich or the that female to see the beauty of him spreading out that wing 
but sometimes in exposing ourselves, in exalting ourselves, for folks to see what we can do, for folks to see what kind of gifting we have, for folks to applaud us and to say, oh, you are this and you are that. We don't understand sometimes the trouble that we bring to ourselves. And so learn from the way of the snake in as much as its skin is beautiful and is desirable for men to even use it to make shoes and other things which are expensive in the realm of humanity. The snake, even with that beauty on the skin that he has, keeps himself, himself camouflage. He is not opening up himself and displaying himself and exalting himself. No, no, no. That snake stays put. That snake is discreet and keeps below the radar. He knows that his life depends on it. He doesn't have hands and he doesn't have feet, but he's going to survive. And one of the features of his survival, and he instinctively knows it, he stays calm and is not exalting himself and showing that I have beautiful spots and I have a green coloration or I have a yellow coloration with spots interspersed to make me look beautiful. No, no, no. Even if he thinks that he is beautiful, instinctively he knows that he ought to humble himself and stay calm and carry on. It is how he is going to survive in his environment. And I, that, that is a lesson within itself. And I want us to understand whoever we think we are and whatever we think we have achieved and however we think we have sharpened our instrument and we can preach like uh, uh, the best of preachers and we can sing like an angel and, and we can play like angels on high and we can do this or we can do that and we want folks to see who we are and what we can do. I want us to understand that when we push our necks up, be careful. That is when you are seen so that the guillotine can be sent around to cut off your neck. Even Jesus, when they came to hold on to him, to carry him away, they did not even know when they came down which one of them was Jesus. They had to point him out. So this glorious God that became man could have had clothes different from everybody else, could have had glory emanating from him so that he would be seen and known even as he was carrying out his task and his work on earth but he didn't do that he humbled himself he became a man like any other man to the extent that those who wanted him have to make an, make, make an arrangement with judas to point him out and how judas couldn't didn't even have to say that one over there with the beard because they all had beard that one over there with the particular, they all, they look alike. You couldn't tell Jesus different from John. That one over there with the sandal, they all had sandals. Judas had to say to them, listen, the one who I hug up and kiss, he had to go pinpoint him because he was not there exalting himself and showing that I am Messiah. He blended in. Beloved, we better blend in. We better stay low. We better be humble. Understand the way of the snake. He is wise and know that he has no hands, he has no feet. He has to crawl on his belly. And as a result, he is prone to be attacked. So he stays under the radar and he does what he has to do. And he's not going to die of starvation. That is how he survives. He creeps up on his food and he catches them because he has perfected the art of staying calm, working with his environment, not exalting himself, and being discreet in his walk. This is the way of the snake. And we must pull from that and learn to be humble and operate within our environment. 
learn not to exalt ourselves, not to love the spotlight, but to be humble in mind and in heart, in spirit. And that way you will go through and survive in your walk with God. In a world system that is against you. In an environment that wants to entrap you. In an environment that wants to crush you. You will be able to survive. Just be humble. Don't exalt yourself. And learn that from the serpent. Be discreet. And be wise in our actions. And we will understand. We will understand that that is a critical way, a critical mode of operation of the serpent. And beloved, understand, he survives. So we should know that. Now, the serpent understands. Secondly, the serpent understands its vulnerability. He understands that. The first thing we said is that we must adapt the good characteristics of the serpent. And we went down into some things. But then the next thing we must understand about the serpent, he understands his vulnerability. He knows his weakness. That's a part of the way, the wisdom of the serpent. He knows his, his, he, he knows his strength, but he also knows, instinctively, he knows his weakness. And knowing your weaknesses, beloved, is a great way for us to prepare ourselves so that we can be protected from the onslaught of the adversary. We must know where we are strong, but we must equally know where we are weak. And I want us to understand that the adversary, the enemy, is going to strike you where he knows you can strike back where he knows that you are weak. Yes? So that is very important. We must know where our weaknesses are. Virgin, some folks have weaknesses in areas that others don't have it in. Some folks are weak um, in the flesh. And if you know that you have a weakness, gentlemen, when it comes on to ladies, then you must know that you don't leave yourself exposed. Don't leave yourself alone in a quiet place with a lady. You know your weakness. You know that you cannot just sit across the way and talk and all kind of things don't rush through your mind. So what is going to happen now? You're going to have to know that. How is it that some other person seems to do that and they seem to have no problem? But if I ever dare come that close, then there is a problem. If that is an ear that you are weak in, know that you are weak there. Pray much about it. And try your endeavor best. In fact, don't try. Do your best not to leave yourself exposed, you and this lady alone, because you know where your weakness lie. And this is the wisdom of the serpent. He knows his vulnerability. He knows his area of weakness. He understands it. And as a result, he makes the necessary adjustments. He knows. And I'm saying to us, that serpent that knows his weakness, he puts in place some defense mechanism that will give him leverage over his enemy. How is that? That adversary knows how to strategize. He knows how to be tactful. He knows how to prepare himself. He knows how to anticipate what your move is going to be so that he can plan his next move. If you, as, as much as the serpent, the snake, has that poison that can cause him to protect, defend himself if you come near to him. He doesn't know what you're coming with. You can walk to him and he doesn't see that you have a machete, that if he ever dares to jump out at you, you one swing and his head is gone. So he's not going to just see you and run out at you. First thing that we ought to understand about the snake is that, one, the snake is discerning. That snake is going to know that if a human presence, if another predator, another from the animal kingdom comes near, whatever he was doing, he stops. He discerns danger and he draws back. 
if he just runs out, say, the danger is here, I'm going to deal with the danger. He knows that he doesn't have hands. He doesn't have feet to run and to dance and to skip and to maneuver himself. He doesn't have that. So he's aware of what he has and what he doesn't have. And so the first thing that that serpent does is that he discerns that danger. Somebody or something is near that can attack him and kill him. So he camouflages and he hides himself. We ought to understand, beloved, that we must be discerning. The snake has a characteristic about him. He is discerning. So one, he understands his vulnerability. He knows his weakness. And he protects himself. He protects, he covers that weakness. Two, that snake is discerning. He cannot fight very well. He cannot run very fast. In fact, he cannot run any at all. Although he can slither away, he cannot run because he has no feet. He cannot fight back. And he knows he has no hands. He can't draw a sword. A lot of things he cannot do, and he's aware. So he understands his weakness. That is wisdom. He is discerning. He knows when danger is lurking. And so he pulls back. Because if he doesn't, and he doesn't know where exactly the danger is, except that he knows that it is around, he pulls back, and he hides himself, and he stays calm. He stays calm. And that is significant. That is important. The, the, he strategizes, and he pulls back, and he waits. He's not quick to rush out. He's not quick to strike. He pulls back. He waits. He sizes up the enemy. He sizes up the adversary that is coming and sees how he's going to deal with this foe. So before he strikes and start to plea and cast out an attack, which he will do, you know, and which we must do, he first sizes up the situation. That's wisdom. And wait for the moment to strike. And I believe, beloved, these two things we must learn from the way of the serpent, the snake. He doesn't rush out into everything. He doesn't exalt himself. He understands his weakness. He is discerning of his environment. He pulls back when he senses danger and keeps calm. So that we must pull back when danger is lurking and keep calm in the presence of God. Find the mind of God. Reach out to God as we wait for direction. They that wait upon the Lord. So there is a time to wait. There is a time to draw back. There is a time in our discerning the situation and understanding the environment that we keep calm and that calmness is in our closet that calmness is, is in our secret place where we seek the face of God and we seek the mind of God and then till we hear from God and we are confident as to how to approach and then we move on the offensive we are not no longer on the defensive we move and we strike and we deal with the adversary that has come into our environment that is the way of the snake he takes his time and he sizes up. He discerns danger in the environment and he moves under cover and he stays put while he assesses and strategizes and works out what tactic he will use. Sometimes they wait for the prey to pass. They wait for the danger to pass and then they strike when the danger is unaware of their presence and it, that creature that is passing is caught off guard, can't defend himself anymore. The, the, the snake wraps himself and squeezes it to death. Another time, he senses, and if he realizes that 
you know that he is there. He's not going to wait anymore because he know that you now have the upper hand because you can plan your thing to kill him. So once he is aware and he discerns that you know that his presence is there, he's going to come at you and, whoosh, and try to get your self-defense to kill you before you kill him. So he discerns and he strategizes and he ensures that he's either hiding or you don't know. And if he knows that you know, then he's going to reach out and boom, smike at you, strike at you to get rid of the threat. He knows when to move. And I'm saying, virgin beloved, we can learn this from the snake. Discern your environment. Knows when, no, sorry, when everything is sailing smooth. Know when danger is lurking in the corner. Know when sin lies in the corner and is lurking to strike at you. You must discern and know when the things that you're hearing, if they make sense. You must know when people are trying to tear you down or tear somebody down or tear down the work of the ministry. You must be discerning, be wise like the snake. Learn the way of the snake. You must learn when to draw back. You don't just take everything. You must know when to stretch out and say, enough is enough. Go away. Don't put, bring these things to me. Why is it that we are not wise? Jesus said that I send you as sheep before wolves. Therefore, be wise as the serpent. So as we go out, virgin, wolves are there in the church. And Paul spoke about wolves that have come in sheep clothing. Even in the church today, there are folks that are there that act like sheep, but they are not. And I'm not just talking about leadership, because there are many leaders that are wolves in sheep clothing. And Paul spoke about them, and he said that they are there to tear the thing apart. And we ought to be discerning. But we have to also be discerning, discerning because in the midst of the flock itself, there are those that are carrying on like sheep, but they are wolves. And they are waiting for the right time to strike. Jesus is saying, be wise like the serpent. And what is a part of the way of the serpent is wisdom. He knows when how to discern. If the snake knows how to discern, take that from him. Stop running and learn the wisdom of the serpent. He discerns. He quietly. So sometimes you're hearing a thing or you're watching a thing or you're seeing a thing. Take your time in your quiet place. Pray about it. Seek the face of the Lord about it. And know when to step out and say enough is enough. You don't become a cesspool for people to fill you up with garbage. You don't become a cesspool for people to fill you up with unclean things. Understand that the things that constantly flood your mind and your heart, you are ultimately going to become. For as a man thinketh, and the thing that flood your mind, you are going to think about all the time. And as a man thinketh, so is he. That is Bible. So pick out the discerning attitude of the serpent, the snake, and learn from that, that in the environment that we are in, at work or at home or at school or in church or wherever. Be discerning. Know to stay low. Stay put and know when to strike and to say enough is enough or to strike the enemy who is coming camouflage himself trying to get you to sin. It is important that we do that. I want you to know that the adversary is going to strike at you where you are vulnerable and we must actually understand that and it is important very very important now the wisdom of the serpent can be observed in how it uses the rock note the rock notice beloved these are little nuggets that we must pull out you know that we must get that we must appreciate that we must understand Proverbs 30, in the scripture that we read, it spoke of the way of the serpent on a rock. Now, we must be clear of the wisdom of the serpent and how he uses that wisdom while he is on the rock. That rock is very significant because this is exactly what 
Proverbs indicated in Proverbs 30, 18 and 19. The snake on a rock. That rock is slippery. How oh, that snake slither along it, again, today science will give us some highlight on what actually happened and the suction and all of that. But he has, that, that creature has no feet, as I said before, has no hands, and yet it can be on that rock. And there's something that we ought to know about rock. And the first thing that that snake seemingly, instinctively, naturally know is that that rock is a solid foundation. If you see that snake come up on that rock, he's not going to run away from that rock so easily, even if a threat comes. He's going to stay on that rock. In fact, he might hide under the rock. Because he knows instinctive, instinctively that that rock is a strong foundation. And he will glide over that rock and run away. He'll take his time and stand up, see upon that rock, and he looks around. Or sometimes he goes around and he hides behind the rock. It becomes a shelter for him to hide from the prey and wait until you are in a position that he knows he has the upper hand. And then he jumps out and strikes you. And after he, he's done with what he's doing, he slithers back behind that rock. So the, 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 the way of the snake upon a rock is significant because that rock speaks to a foundation that is solid. And the adversary, the snake, knows about a solid foundation and how to make the best use of it. The rock is the firmest foundation to build on. I want us to understand that. Now, many of us have gone into New Kingston, have gone overseas, and you have seen these high-rise buildings going up. You know, and in case you don't, I do a little building sometimes, construction. And I can tell you that if you are going to go high up into the air, if you are going to move from first floor to second floor to 10th floor to 20 floors, if you are going to go 50 floors in the air, and many buildings are much higher than that, then I can tell you, you are going to have to extend your foundation much further, much deeper into the ground. The higher you're going to go, the deeper your foundation is going to have to be. And I want you to understand that one of the firmest foundation that you can ever have is a foundation that is solid rock. And if you build with your foundation and rock, Jesus said it. He said, the, the foolish man builds his house upon the sand, but the wise man builds his house upon the rock. So here it is that the writer in Proverbs was amazed, astounded at how he was able to see the snake going across that rock. And we're just putting it into perspective that he uses that rock for multiple purposes to strike from, to hide behind, to hit at the enemy from. He, he understands instinctively the power of the rock. It is his foundation. So it is a firm thing that he can stand on as he helps to defend himself. Then to hide, he lays low and he makes no noise. He does no bragging. He, he, he keeps everything calm until it is time for him to come from behind the rock and to strike. Brethren, beloved, I have learned something from this. Easily I have learned something from this. Beloved, we have a rock. That rock is Jesus Christ. And we must stand firmly upon this rock because he is our foundation. I want us to understand also, like the snake, he hides behind this rock. I want us to understand that we must learn from the snake and understand that we must not take this rock for granted. We must hide in this rock. He is our hiding place. He is our strong tower. He is our refuge. And so many of us Christians treat Jesus who is our rock with scant regard. We don't realize the foundation upon which we are building is Jesus. We don't understand that we must hide in the rock 
which is Jesus. We are just going day by day as if we just don't know what we're doing. We just turn up at church. We just turn up at work. We're just doing things and don't understand what it is that we are in and who it is we are and who it is Jesus is. He is our rock. And I want us to understand that as the rock, he is the foundation upon which we can build. So if it's in the morning time, stand upon the rock. Stand upon the solid foundation. In the afternoon time, stand upon the rock. Stand upon the solid foundation. In the evening and in the night time, stand upon the rock. Jesus is the rock. Don't put aside Jesus. You, you move away from him, you're moving away from your foundation, from your source. And that is significant. That is absolutely something that we must not lose sight of. Understand who the rock is. And so stand on your foundation, who is Jesus. Hide in your, that rock. Jesus is that place, that shelter that you must run into and hide. And when the storms of life come, don't be afraid. Don't be wondering what you're going to do. You have Jesus. He is your rock into which you can hide. And it is important that you do that. Now notice, this, notice the serpent on the rock. He covers his underbelly. His soft underbelly. And he covers that on the rock. Most folks don't know that under this part that this snake crawls upon. is very soft. And he knows. And he protects his weakness. He doesn't expose it. But he does not outline his, weak, outline his weakness to all and sundry and to everybody here and there. He might have a one first notice that when he's at, he stays on that rock and covers his soft underbelly, the rock helps to protect, to protect his weakness. The rock is the foundation that he knows he can strike from. The rock is the place that he can go behind and hide. The serpent instinctively knows this. We instinctively ought to know. We instinctively know that Jesus is our foundation. Jesus covers our weaknesses and we can hide in Jesus who is our rock. Why is it then that we push Jesus aside from Monday to Saturday and kind of pick him up on a Sunday to come to church and we don't live a certain way during the week. We don't operate a certain way during the week. We don't, we don't, we don't defend the cause of the gospel during the week. We allow people to fill our heads with crazy lies and all kind of, during the week. And then we turn up polluted to worship him on Sunday. Learn from the serpent. The serpent stays on the rock as a power play. He's hiding his weakness, but he can jump out at you. And if he discern you're coming and you don't see him, he's going to slither behind the rock and he's going to hide behind that rock. It's a power play. He never gives away his advantage. He's wise enough. And notice Jesus said it, be wise as a serpent. So there is something about the serpent and wisdom that we all overlook. He knows how to make his move instinctively, naturally. Follow what he does. And I've been sharing those as we came down. Follow it. Stay on the rock. Learn how to maneuver on the rock. Learn how to hide in the rock. Learn how to protect your weakness while you're on the rock. And that rock is Jesus Christ. And though he has his weakness and he can only crawl and he has a soft underbelly, it is made up. He has a quality that fills that weakness, that fills that gap. He has a sharpness in his seeing and his hearing. And he makes the best use of his strengths. He doesn't go about and squander his strength. He doesn't go about and boast about his strength. He uses his strength to his advantage. 
And that sight and that hearing, he works with it. So he sees you before you see him. He hears you before you hear him. And he positions himself so that he is in a place to have the upper hand. As a child of God, as a Christian, I want to embrace these strategies so that it assists me in my fight against the enemy. I don't know about you, but I am not interested in being seen and being known and being this light of the, the life of the party and being the spotlight at the no 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 forget about that know who we are know what we are in and be humble in mind and in heart yes Ex esteem others higher than ourselves look at others and think about them higher than how we think about ourselves that is how the bible puts it that every one of us ought to be and the way of the serpent brings out all of these characteristics. So although the serpent was back there, the instigator and the one that caused sin to come about upon the earth to this day, even from the serpent, we can learn something. And we are seeing a lot that we can learn. And I say to us, apply these things to our lives. Learn these strategies and tactics. Learn to be calm and humble. Learn to stand up on the rock and hide in the rock and cover our weaknesses in the rock, which is Jesus. And don't put him aside and then take him up back when it is convenient. The serpent is smart. And we, like how we learn from the eagle, we can learn from the serpent. And we better learn and apply these things. They will help us to be stronger Christians, to be better Christians, to walk with God, and to be overcoming. Understand, we can learn from the eagle, but we can learn from a serpent. The way of the serpent. Be wise as a serpent. Learn and become better Christians. We then look at the way of a ship in the sea. So one, we started out. We started out with the we started out with the way of the eagle. Then we looked at the way of the serpent. Simple. But it is the simple things that teaches us powerful lessons. And oh if we but just learn those lessons and pull those lessons and apply our hearts to wisdom. We read in Proverbs six and verse six. Learn from the ant, ye sluggard, so that you can be wise. Our ants can teach us wisdom. The eagles can teach us wisdom. Be wise as the serpent. The serpent can teach us wisdom. Let us pull these things and hear from the wise men that wrote the book of Proverbs. The wisdom. And apply them to our hearts. The way of a ship on the sea. Now a sailing vessel, listen to this now. It, it don't have no propeller. It don't have any oars. Those are the thing that you used to. No. It, 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 it doesn't have any engine. And yet, these ships can make their way from point A way over to another country in point B. And I'm not talking about modern ships today with engines and all of those things and compass that. No, I'm not even talking about that because when this proverb was written, this was a few thousand years, hundreds of years ago, probably a thousand and odd years ago, the proverbs was written. And this proverb, uh, almost a thousand years, this proverb um, was written at a time when there was no engine to propel ships along. Yes? As big as the ships were, it were those sails. And then there was another little small thing at the elm, a little thing called the rudder. And that rudder would direct that big, massive ship. And it was an amazement to the wise man how that little thing with those sails could turn the ship from here. The ship could go through boisterous storms. Strong winds might have been blowing, rain falling. And that ship could still make its way sailing even in the night and reach way into another port in another country safely 
and precisely at the place where it should go. And it amazed, it amazed the writer to the extent that it was a wonder that he had to pen it and then look deeper than the actual thing happening, but look at the way, what is behind this major amazement, this major wonder that he observed. But notice, a little rudder and this big thing literally caused that big thing to move to the left, to move eastward, to move westward, and to find its way into safe harbor in some distant land. It is a, an amazement. It is indeed a wonder. And we can see why the, the, the writer saw it in the same way that he saw the eagle, in the same way that he saw the, uh, the snake. He saw the ship going across without capsizing, going without signposts, going without landmark, going without anything, and reach safely over to the other side. What we now know, beloved, is that that little rudder, as small as it is in comparison to that big ship, did an amazing job. That little rudder, could, could go a particular direction, could go another direction, and based on how it is directed, cause the ship to go eastward, westward, northward, or southward. Of course, it is working along with the sails that the breeze blow into and cause the ship to move, and then that rudder directs it so that it goes along a particular course and reach safely to the port on the other side. And it is important to note that the air actually blows in front of the sail. It is not the air that go, blow behind the sail that propels it, which is another strange thing. It is the air that blow at the front of the sail. Normally, you would have thought the air blowing behind the sail will push it. But no, the air that is the, 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 the sails that are up depend on the here to hit it front ways, and then that now navigates the ship to get from point A to point B, and that by itself is significant. But most importantly, once those sails cause the ship to be moving and to be going into a particular motion and at a particular speed, that little rudder now guides it. So small in comparison to the size of the big ship, and that was a marvel. That was a, an amazement, the way of the ship. How could one little thing direct such a large thing called a ship to move, to get from one port to another in a different land? It was an amazement. But there is something about that entire narrative that strikes a chord. And we see that jumping out at us as we look in the book of James. James chapter 3. And I want us to quickly run through this because we just want to wrap this up and then go to the last one so we can wrap up this segment this evening. And so James chapter 3, and we start at verse 3. There is something very peculiar about what James is saying and how it is paralleled with what the Proverbs wrote about on a ship on the sea. But let us start with verse 3. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great are driven by, and are driven of fierce winds, yet, they, yet are they turned about with a very small helm whithersoever the governor listed. Let us pause here. Because verse 4 talks about the very ship that Proverbs chapter 30, verses 18 and 19, speaks about the ship that, the way of the ship through the sea. The writer of Proverbs is amazed. He, he wonders, he is in a wonder at that old episode, that, that old narrative that he is 
looking at in front of him and watching as it transpires the ship sailing through the sea and going eastward or going westward or going northward or going southward. He's amazed. It, it, it just captures him. But in it, there is a lesson. And whereas he did not give us the lesson, we understand from all the narratives above that in all of these things, the way of the eagle and the way of the snake and the way of the ship and the way of the man and the woman, that there are lessons that, and wisdom that we can pull to apply to ourselves that can teach us wisdom in our walk with God. And so here now we find that James in the New Testament is looking at a ship just the same. And he's saying, behold also the ship. And as great as the ship is, which though they be so great, they are driven through fierce winds and they are turned about with a very small helm. That little thing that we call the rudder, that little thing that is like a little governor, it turns and based on how they use that little thing, it is so small in comparison to the big size of the ship. And that little thing is so powerful that it determines the destiny of the ship. If it reached to the port or not. If it reached safely over the other side or not. It's not the wood, the precious wood that the ship is made over, made out of, that determines if it is going to reach over to the other side. As nice as the wood is, and as nice as the things are that they lay over to give it that beauty and that, that, that prestige and pristine look, None of those things determine the direction of the ship. It is that little rudder, that little helm, that little thing at the helm, the rudder. That is what determines the destiny of the ship, that big ship. James now writes in the New Testament using the same ship and the same little thing at the helm that directs the ship. He calls it, it governs it wherever he, he lists it. It is the same thing that we are talking about in the book of Proverbs. And the writer now in the New Testament, James, to be exact, now says that, listen, it is an amazement. He didn't use those terms. But just by what he has written, the big, great thing, with one little thing, how it works, you're going to see how amazed he is when you see what he applies it to. And this is where we want to go to the next verse now and start, look at the ship with the little rudder. And look at ourselves as a ship with the little rudder. Let us look at what Paul, sorry, James writes. And how he puts them and parallels our ship. This old ship has been through battles before. So this is a ship. But how is this ship governed? Is it the me? Is it, what is it? that governs where and how we go through the murky waters of our existence and leave from this port to the other. We are going to find that the same thing that governs the big ship, which is the rudder, is the same thing that governs this ship, this big body, this ship which is on its way to glory, is also governed by this little rudder. But, but James puts it this way. And he now links the ship with the rudder to I with my tongue and you with your tongue. And he said, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasted great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little fire kinglet. We can't even go into the tongue tonight, this evening because the tongue is a different, probably when we finish this now, Probably two studies down the line, we're going to look at the tongue and we're going to do a little study on the, the anatomy of the Christian. Look at the head and the eyes and the nose, the mouth, the tongue. But suffice it to say, you know, that will come. But James is now linking up the tongue as a part of the body with the ship, with the little rudder. And he said, behold, how, behold, how great a matter a little fire kinglet, verse 6. And then as we go on, we see where he's saying, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. 
that it defiled the whole body and set it on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell very significant so follow me. so we don't even have to say much because the thing is just so deep it, it is just so self-explanatory we are seeing the parallel between this ship the body and the rudder the tongue we are seeing the parallel with our body and the actual ship itself with the liquor rudder that determines its course and its destiny i submit to you beloved that this tongue can determine where you make it or whether you make it from port earth to port heaven the tongue directs the ship and as little as it is in the same way as little as the rudder is on the ship it directs the course of the ship to ensure that that ship reached the port on the other side and this tongue is tearing the ship of our body and we better be careful that it is tamed so that it can properly direct the ship to reach the port to the, on the other side for every kind of beast and of bird and of serpent and of things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind verse 8 but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. So we ought to be careful now. So we are learning some things. That this tongue is loose and we have to understand that it is what is now guiding the ship. And by virtue of the things that we utter, by virtue of the things that we continue to say, by virtue of how we can light a fire with it, by virtue of how we can destroy people with it, James is saying, be very careful. Because in the same way that the rudder leads the ship to a port, to its destiny, this rudder, which is the tongue, be careful by virtue of what it can do. It can cause destruction and cause the ship to be destroyed and miss the port. It's full of deadly poison. Verse 9, it's full of de deadly poison. And so, therewith bless we God, even the Father. And therewith curse we men, the same tongue. And we better understand what, what James is saying is the reality in the lives of a lot of Christians. You see them with their hands up in the ears and in the ear, sorry, worshiping God and glorifying God. You see them jumping and skipping and dancing and rolling their eyes and magnifying God. But you wait until church is over. And this is what James is saying, the apostle is saying, and which we better be careful of. I thank God that these are the things, you know, that we are looking at to learn wisdom, the way of the ship in the sea. We're pulling out this. The tongue is the big part that has everything to do with, we. you know, how God has to tame this tongue. That's why when we get the Holy Ghost, you know, God take control of the tongue and cause us to speak with tongues as a sign that the Holy Ghost is coming, that the, we are now under the control of the the spirit of almighty god is the tongue he used because this is the unruly member this is what if you can if he controls this and he shows his control when he gave us the holy ghost and allow for other tongues to flow he is in control and this is how now we can steer the ship by virtue of how we bless god by virtue of how we worship god by virtue of how we lift up the brethren by virtue of how we edify the brethren by virtue of how we preach the word this thing now will steer this ship steer the ship into the right direction and that is so important with the tongue we bless god the father and with the same tongue now after a while some of some people turn around and we curse men and we swear after people and we carry on that is wrong i am submitting to us that the tongue cannot be used to bless god and at the same time to curse men and to backbite and to tear down and to try to destroy the work of god and the work of the ministry you are going to be in trouble if you do that and I am standing here, I am your teacher today, I am, I, I'm your pastor same way, I am your teacher same way, but I am telling you, you are setting up yourself to fall for your ship to crash if you don't bring this rudder called the tongue under subjection, under subjection of the Holy Ghost and under your subjection. You are setting up yourself to be destroyed for the ship to come to shipwreck and learn the way of the ship 
over the sea. The rudder plays a critical role. And this ship today is crucial that we understand that we are sailing onto Zion. And this ship is a clean ship. And this ship is a strong ship. And this ship is a powerful ship. And all of us are ships on our way to glory. Make sure that the rudder is carrying us in the right direction. No, not going east, not east. If we are, if we are bound for north, don't go east and southwest. And, uh, no, if we're bound for north, make sure that we bring under subjection the rudder, the tongue, so that we can use it. And as we worship God with the tongue, we are heading in the right direction. If it is not that we must go to meet the king, we are going straight north. And be careful. I say this to protect us as we walk with God. This tongue has caused God to open up the earth and swallow up men in Moses' days. This tongue has caused God to smite Miriam with leprosy. Back again in Moses' days, the tongue has caused God to to bring and rain down judgment upon people, the tongue, because the people don't understand you can't talk against the church and say, is the church you're talking against, not God, because the church belongs to God. We have lost our minds and we are lacking wisdom if we believe we can tear down the church and we're not fighting against God. This is why when Paul fought the Christians, Jesus met him. He was killing them and think he was doing good and getting rid of them. Jesus met him on the road, the Damascus road, and smite him off that horse and said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul wasn't persecuting Jesus. Jesus had already gone and, and, and ascended back into heaven. Jesus said, why are you persecuting me if you persecute the church? You're persecuting Jesus. If you're fighting against the church, you're fighting against Jesus. And I am saying this, learn wisdom from the Proverbs. Anybody that use this rudder and use this tongue to breathe out fight things and breathe out fire against the church of God and try to tear down the work of God, you're going to see your end. I can tell you what it is going to be. But let me not tell you, but let me just warn you. Be careful. I must be careful. You must be careful. But your end is sealed if you continue to use the rudder in this ship, which is your life, the tongue, to fight against the work of God, the work of the ministry. You are going to pay dearly. You can never fight God and win. You can never fight the church because if you fight and try to stop the church and to stop the work of God and to stop the work of the ministry if you try to destabilize the work of God you are destabilizing yourself and you talk it and you convince others or you try to tear down and you try to cause separation and segregation and oh God you don't know what you're doing to yourself your corner is dark and you will never reach the other side you will have shipwreck that is biblical principle. And so the wisdom from this is to use the tongue to glorify God. Go on to verse 10. Use the tongue to serve God and not to tear down and to spew out evil and to hurt your brother and to mess up your, your, your brothers and your sisters. Be careful. You are hurting yourself. Self. Out of the same mode proceeded blessing and cursing. That cannot be. You are two-faced. You're a hypocrite. This, the writer said these things ought not to be so. Cannot be. That's hypocritical. You're a hypocrite. You're either serving God and praising God or you are blessing God and cursing man. That's hypocrisy. Learn the wisdom. Pick out the thing. Apply it to our hearts and understand that the wisdom is to help us to move, to walk right, to walk better, to elevate ourselves and to make sure that we reach over on the other side. Read on. I'm going to just close off on this one quickly and we just close off at the end. Does a fountain send forth at the same time, uh, at the same place, sweet water and bitter? Of course we know it doesn't. 
can the fig tree, my virgin bear olive berries, either a vine's fig, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh water. It is impossible. Reader, it is impossible. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge? Remember, no, you know, knowledge, wisdom is applied knowledge. So he's now asking, who is a wise man? Remember, this, all of this thing, you know, is to get wisdom, to pull out the wisdom that is hidden in the way of the eagle, to pull out the wisdom that is hidden in the way of the snake on a rock, to pull out the wisdom that is hidden in the way of the ship sailing across the ocean. So who is a wise man? Who is he that is pulling out the wisdom that is hidden in these things? And understand that the tongue is like the rudder and the ship and will cause the ship to miss the port and to have shipwreck. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Who among you that talk so much, that spew out venom so much, that have a loose tongue so much, that have lost control of, who among you is a wise man and have knowledge among you? Who? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Good conversation? Use this. Good way of life? Live right. So that through your works, people can see meekness of wisdom. If you're going to be wise, tame your tongue. If you're going to be wise, tame your tongue. That is what we pull out from the third one, the way of the ship sailing across the ocean, sailing across the sea. Pull that out and understand. Zip up. Worship God. Let him control the tongue and let the rudder, the tongue of this ship guide to the correct port. And we close with the fourth one. And that's the fourth of the four things that the wise, men, wise man said that he saw the way of a man with a maid. So we have to cut them short because we can't exhaust it. And at other times, we will pick up on the tongue, because that is a subject by itself, as I said. So this fourth thing was also an amazement to Agor. That's the, 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 the man that wrote this particular proverb, the way of a man with a maid. And we close with this one. What is the way of a man with a maid? What exactly is he talking about? He's literally talking about the relationship of a man and a woman. He's talking about uh, a man getting into the space of a woman, a woman getting into the space of a man, and the things, the chemistry that comes with that, uh, how powerful it is, how, the things that it can cause. He's seeing some things and he wonders, did you know that a man and a woman can get together, a man can see somebody for the first time and all of a sudden something just happens, something just get off in somebody's head, something just run from him, the head down to the, to the feet and we wonder what happened. They, we said that there is a chemistry, we use the term chemistry and you know, I don't want us to think that the thing is just a physical thing. I, I want us to understand. So when we use the term chemistry, we are literally referring to the, the intense feeling of connection and passion and romance that people in relationships share. You know, we talk about chemistry, we're talking about all of these things combined. It is what draws men and women together and helps you to, to kind of come into sync, you know, synchronize. Whatever it is, we can't put our hand on it. The, the writer of Proverbs couldn't do it. Even today, with the science that we have, we are still unable to clearly define and explain what really happens when that chemistry comes together and a man and a woman, different background, different thing, and they get together and they just click and something come together. I want to share a few things with that because it is very significant and it is something that we can pick out of that that will give us wisdom for our walk with Almighty God. Now, 
we know a young lady can be quite content with her friends, quite happy with her family. You know, the chores that she do when she's at home, the job, a little holiday job, whatever, when she's at school. She can be good with her friends, even if it's a male friend. Both of them can just have a decent relationship and they run up and down. Things like love and sex, when she's not uh, taking advantage of and so forth. Things like love and sex don't even bother her. She's just uh, focused on a particular thing and she's not perturbed by any of those things. And so she just goes about our reg her regular business and do whatever it is that she normally would have done and she's quite fine. But lo and behold, one day a young man happened to pass by and that young man might say something to her very nice. And so with words, he injects something into her mind, into her system that caused a shift and caused things to be released into her system that all of a sudden this lady who had no intention to get into a relationship, she was just fine doing what she was doing. She wasn't even at age of age and she was just focusing on what was important to a young lady at the time and all of a sudden that man comes and start to give her attention and start to speak certain words into her ears and start to make promises and then without even knowing it something is lit inside of her and she start to feel something and he himself start to feel something that he might never have felt before something happens there's some a, 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 a fire is lit Something is struck, and we don't know exactly what happened. Even today, scientists are trying to find out what it is that caused that spark that make out of all the millions of ladies around, a man just find this particular damsel that he is just so enthralled over. His mind and his focus and his attention is just locked in on her and nobody else. What is it about this lady that... Just the words that this man has spoken and the attention that he has given to her. Look how many other men might have spoken similar words and it just didn't happen. Look how many other ladies might have looked in your, your direction and you just didn't see them. But all of a sudden, there is this chemistry and connection that happens, that emotional build-up, that physical attraction. Everything just come together and you you want to get together as one. You want to get together as husband and wife. In fact, the thing can be so deep that this lady that lived with her parents, that this lady that was well brought up, that this lady that was so focused on her schoolwork and her, what is ahead of her, it can be so deep, this chemistry, this thing with a man and a woman that caused the wise man to say, I can't understand it. It is so amazing. It is so deep that this lady will be willing to Elope. Let us say the parents are not in agreement. You know that this thing called love, this thing between the man and the woman that the writer spoke about, is so intense, it is so deep. And we're not even talking about sexual love right now, not even the sexual part, but the thing that catches them and she just don't want nothing, nobody, nothing but him, but him, but him, but she, but she, but she. You don't even want it. It's real, it is there. She would be willing to run off with him. She, uh, she would be willing to follow him anywhere himself to go and don't even fear. Have you ever seen some, some ladies and you see the men that they are attracted to? And you say, what a beautiful lady. What's she doing with that ruffian? And she's desperate and the parents trying to stop and just run off. That little thing called love, that chemistry, that thing between a man and a damsel, a man and a maid, it puzzled the wise man. He couldn't understand how you could have, and no matter how a preacher, a pastor, a parent, a grandparent, counsel and said, no, don't do it. If it is there, and many times it is strong enough, I don't want to hear my mother, I don't want to hear my father. Mother said, look here, I am helping you, I don't want you to make that mistake. Leave me, let me make my mistake. You made yours, let me make mine. This is how this thing that Olga spoke about was so intense and so deep. 
But then there is something about that. Did you know that that chemistry can fizzle out? Did you know that that passion will wear off? Did you know that that depth of love and passion and togetherness and to the extent that you will run off to Africa with him, take a run, take a banana boat and go to Africa, you would do that. You would leave the best high school and university and take a banana boat with a Rasta man or any man or a Rasta woman or any woman once the chemistry is right. And yet that same chemistry over time fizzles and you wonder. And this is how folks separate, go their separate way, and things just happen. How? But the, it, it, it sounds impossible, but it is life. Because Augur, in looking at a man and a maid, knows that a man and a maid comes together. But he also knows that a man and a maid can drift apart. And he looks at the way, and although it was an amazement to him how they came together, he didn't say anything, but he, he was amazed at the way of the man and the maid. What could amaze him? We can only infer. But he could be amazed at how passionate and tight it is that they will run away together. And at the same time, this same couple pull apart. Did you know that when we get saved, and I'm cutting out some of the other parts of it. Let me just flip over the slide so just get to the bottom of it and just jump over. I, I think this would have been the lab. We won't even go to the other part. We'll just keep it at this and we'll end it right here. Did you know that the chemistry that brings a man and a woman together, there is a different chemistry, but there is a chemistry that brings a man and God together? Do you know that there is a relationship that you, if you can recall when you just got saved, genuinely got saved, you wanted to pray all the time. You wanted to be in the house of God all the time. You wanted to be close to the things of God all the time. And there was a chemistry that was there, just like the chemistry of the man and the woman, the man and the maid. In fact, the chemistry and the relationship, again, is paralleled in Scripture. Because the man and the woman that amazed the writer of Proverbs, Jesus used the man and the woman relationship to speak about the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church, God and man. And he used them and put them together and said it is a similar thing. Not only that, Jesus now in the book of Revelation said at one point to the church, to his bride, Listen to me. You have left your first love. So as passionate as the thing was and the chemistry was strong and we came to God. And this is not man and woman, no. This is man and his creator. Man and God. I want to say man in this context here, no. It's man and woman. And they're God. And it is tight and it is firm and it is passionate and it is strong. And it is supposed to be forever. And the amazing thing is that just like the man and the maid was passionate and then later drift apart, the same thing seemed to happen with us and God to the extent where Jesus said at one point, I stand at your door and knock. No, when he came to you first, he was inside. Notice the progression. He was inside and there was a passionate, passionate love and, 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 and desire and a strong relationship and you pray and you read the Bible and nobody enough push you to pray and push you to read the Bible and push you to walk right. And your conscience was clean and clear and soft. You only want to hear a word from the scripture, a word from the preacher. And you organize yourself because your conscience was so soft. But then after a while, the conscience becomes seared with a hot iron. The word don't reach you anymore. 
The scriptures don't reach you anymore. The preacher don't reach you anymore. And all of a sudden, we see Jesus on the outside knocking and asking to come in. Guess, guess what? It is him knocking on the heart, not of the unsaved. You know. Remember, he's knocking at the door of people who are in the church. He was once inside. Look where he is now, on the outside, knocking to come in. I don't want to see what is happening. So in the church, a lot of folks are still in church, even in Ephesus. And Jesus is saying to you, remember your first love. Remember from where thou hast fallen. Repent. Come back. For it is not what it used to be. The passion is not there. The zeal is not there. The love is not there. The desire is not there. You're just going through the motion. The writer said, wow, the way of a man and a woman. Sometime up, some, I can learn something from that. He didn't tell you what the lesson was, so I'm sharing with us. Understand is a same relationship. Husband and wife. Jesus and the church. Together. Love. Passion. Sticking to it. We are out. Just like the man and the maid do. We allow the thing to drift apart. It shouldn't happen. It don't need to happen. It ought not to happen. But Satan is fighting again. So we will have to learn now. I said, for us, it's not going to happen. In, 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 in the same Proverbs. Oh God, we're going to come to that later down in another study. Because so much to learn. My beloved is gone. He was knocking and I didn't answer. And he's gone. And by the time I open the door, because I'm there just delaying and say, I still need to do this, and I still need to do that, and I still need to enjoy this, and I still need, and we open up and say, boy, God, I decide to come back now. But when we open, my beloved is gone, and we start running down the road looking for him, and lo, he is gone. We only can smell the fragrance of his perfume, but he's not there. For we allow the chemistry to die down. We allow everything to fizzle out. We allow the separation to take place that God don't want to take place, neither with the man and the maid, or you and the Lord. He didn't want that to happen, but we allowed it to happen because we are not wise. And there is wisdom with the eagle, wisdom with the snake, wisdom with the ship, and wisdom with the man and the woman. What's the wisdom? Do, what's the wisdom with us, the man and the maid? Do everything in your power. To keep your relationship together. And it is inside of both of you to make it happen no matter what. In the same way, your relationship vertically with you and God. Do everything in your power. Because chemistry will fizzle. Passions will fizzle. But with that understanding, we must move to do what is necessary to bring the love back together, to bring the passion back together, to make the chemistry work again so that we can return to our first love, which is the love that we must have for God, which must be passionate, which must be hot, which because if it's lukewarm, he's going to spew you out. If it is cold, he has nothing to do with you, unless you repent that he can come back to you. But if you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, he do have nothing to do with you. So the key is to be hot, 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 hot at all times. And we can be. We have learned the lesson. We can see the wisdom of the man and the woman. The thing can get cold. What we must pull out, do what we must. Everything within our power that the chemistry don't die. The passion don't go cold. And the separation don't take place. Wisdom from the Proverbs. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God and he is our maker. And we must serve him and we must love him. And whatever we do, get into his presence every day. Let him touch us. Don't make a day pass and him don't touch us. So that we can keep warm and the warmth of the relationship. And when it feel like it is getting cold, Go on a three-day fast. Get back into the presence of the Lord. Wisdom is not going to happen automatically. We are going to make it happen. I think the time is upon us. 
I think the time is well past, but I stop here because I will go over and gone into some other things. But let me stop it here for the evening. God richly bless you. God richly bless you. I call it quits for this evening. And um, we are going to pray. And we pick up next week and go into a new area, a new section, a new study. Again, we are going to come from the Proverbs because I want us to understand that there are so many things that we can learn from the Proverbs. Virgin beloved, we're going to take our time and we're going to go through. Let us look at these little scriptures. Let us look at these simple things and let us learn. Let us grasp what it is that we can grasp so that we can extract the wisdom that is contained in them and we can put them to practice in our lives so that we can become better men and women of God as we live for him, as we strive for the mastery, and as we strive to make it into the kingdom of heaven. God bless you. We close for this evening. Let us, let us pray. Father, we thank you, mighty God. Another time we come before your presence and we say thank you for allowing us to share in Bible study. I thank you for the words that have been disseminated and I pray, Father in heaven, that you will let them find a place in the hearts of your people, in all of our hearts. Help us to pick out the things that are wisdom, the nuggets that are there that we can apply to our lives so that we can walk the walk of a child of God. They might be simple things. They might be coming from way back, but they are there for our edification. Help us, mighty God, to pick out these things and then to walk and to govern our lives accordingly. Thank you for your people. Bless abundantly, mighty God. Strengthen us. Hold all of us in the hollows of your hands. Let your name be glorified. We give you thanks. We bless you. We lift you up, mighty God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God richly bless you. Thank you for staying with us this, for a long Bible study. But we are finished. Didn't want to carry it over to next week. Next week we pick up on something new. Same time, same place, in the house of the Lord. And we, we go through. Be blessed. Look forward to see you on Sunday as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And keep on keeping on. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.